All right. Um, hi, everybody. So it's super nice to be back uh, in Berlin for OffensiveCon, and uh, we are very happy to present our first results with Pedro. Unfortunately, Pedro couldn't travel to Berlin, so he's joining via Zoom call. So it's an interesting setup. Let's see how that's going to work out. All right. So um, today we'll show you how to pawn your router over the internet. And we'll start with giving you some impressions about the network uh, devices types that we see. And then we'll move on to LAN versus WAN exploitation. And then we'll give you some uh, of our experience particip participating and um, finding vulnerabilities for pawn to targets. Um, eventually, we'll uh, show details for three WAN exploits that we use at the, at the competition. And then we'll close the presentation with some uh, future outlook um, in this area. About us, my name is Radek Domański. I'm coming from system and network engineering background. I have been working in security for over a decade now. Uh, my research interest is in embedded devices, IoT devices, automotive security. Uh, yeah, Pedro, gonna say a few words about yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Pedro. Um, I'm a founder of Agile Information Security. We're a small uh, UK-based security consultancy. We focus on, uh, you know, penetration testing, reverse engineering, this kind of stuff. And uh, I also like to break stuff, uh, you know, focusing on also embedded devices, uh, SCADA, enterprise apps, a little bit of everything. And, uh, you know, I just want to say I'm really sorry for not being there. Believe me, the loss is mine. Uh, I am fully vaccinated, but my vaccine is not accepted in Germany. It is what it is. Uh, but I'd like to thank the offensive coin guys, you know, especially Miguel, uh, Lucas, all the staff for making this happen. Uh, and together, we're the flashback team. That's our war name, what we use in Pond to Own. Uh, and we also have a nice YouTube channel, or at least we like to think it's nice. Uh, we encourage you to check it out later and uh, have a look. And thank you very much. Okay, let's get going. So, network routers. When we uh, talk about network devices, we like to put them into categories. So in the first category, you will have consumer routers. And these are the routers that when you go to Amazon, you select TP-Link, Netgear, you just buy them and put them in your home network. You connect all your home devices at home. And the reason you would do that is because the um, network router that you got from your, your ISPs maybe doesn't have enough performance, you would like to have more features, or maybe you'd like to run your own custom firmware on it. And then you have a cable modem. And cable modem is a very important device from the ISP uh, perspective because it terminates ISP connection at your home. It is uh, transparent for the for the router that you have, you have at home, um, but um, for the ISP, it, it is fully controllable device. So it means it can control its firmware, it controls its con its configuration, which is signed or cryptogra uh, cryptographically signed. So, for instance, the speed of your service is part of this configuration. Um, it is also being authenticated by the net devices on the ISP network, so that means you cannot take any device and plug into ISP network and expect to have a working connection. Uh, and on top of that, all the traffic between cable modem and, uh, and the devices on the network are encrypted, so if you're able, even if you're able to intercept anything, it's, you can't make any, sense of, make any sense of the data that you see. Uh, then we have enterprise routers, and those are depending on the size of the business that is using that. They may be quite small or really beefy devices, uh, and it can implement a lot of features which helps enterprise to be connected uh, to the outside world. And then eventually the core network routers, and these are the routers which run the internet. They are used in the backbone networks and used to connect ISPs to, together. They're usually very well isolated. There is not much uh, access to those, um, probably not much security research on them as well. Uh, and they will be not part of, of this um, presentation. But to give you a better idea again about how the cable modem and router interact together, how they differ, uh, take a look at the first scenario. So in, I mentioned before they terminate the ISP's network at your home. And so they do all the connections, set up and everything. And then if you have consumer router, you can connect the one interface to that um, cable modem. And that was, uh, this setup was um, 
maybe you've seen more in a, in the past. And nowadays, if you order service from your ISP, uh, likely the second scenario will be um, available for you. So, so the ISP will ship you a, a device, a network device, but logically the cable modem and the router will be integrated into that one device. So you can see the cable modem is also quite interesting research area. And what about the enterprise routers? So when we speak with Pedro about enterprise routers, we like to call them like consumer routers on steroids because Actually, but like if you look closer, they are very similar. They they implement similar services. Maybe um, they have like similar architectures. Uh, maybe because they're targeted for business customers, they maybe even have more uh, services av available on the on the one interface, uh, like the WAF, like um, proxies, VPN uh, endpoints, and so on. Uh, but event like essentially, they sit on the edge of the of the business of, uh, and then connect them to the, to the internet. And then as you will see later in the presenta presentation, they have similar problems as consumer routers. All right, so Pedro, maybe you can give us some information about LAN versus WAN exploitation. Um, You're before muted. we start, yeah. uh, let's uh, understand some concepts. Uh, one thing to understand is most network devices have two or more physically and logically separated domains. What do we mean by domains? So in an example that we have here on screen, which is a consumer router, uh, we have the one wider network. This is what connects you to the wider internet, right? To the outside world. And then you have the LAN, which, you know, it's, you can connect via Ethernet or via Wi-Fi, which is your internal network. Obviously, the LAN is a trusted domain or a more trusted domain than the one. Um, and, you know, most hacks that you see, uh, most exploits are for the LAN. As I said, this is the internal trusted network. So it has a lot of services listening, right? So stuff like uh, UPnP, so there's a huge source of vulnerabilities. Uh, there's the HTTP configuration server. Uh, there are custom vendor services, you know, of which we have an example here. As you can see, this is one of our videos. Uh, we encourage you to check it out. It's a command injection in a custom uh, vendor service. Um, and the thing is, the you know, the LAN, you can call it an internal trusted network, but in some cases it might not be trusted. So obviously it is different to have uh, a LAN in your home where you only have devices you trust, or at least you think you do. And it's another thing when it's a shared public space, right? So a coffee shop, a museum, a mall, those are still LANs, you know, but they might be run by different devices and have a different level of trust, um, which is the enterprise LAN. So enterprise routers also, several, also manage several networks and domains. Uh, they might have more than two domains, you know, they might have a management network, they might have an office LAN. In the previous example, in a mall uh, or a museum, they might have a separate, like, public LAN. Uh, and they typically have uh, at multiple one interfaces, so the external interface where you come in. Um, so, yeah, you know, the same concepts that we apply to the, to the consumer routers, we can really apply to the enterprise routers, just a question of having more of that stuff in the enterprise routers. Um, okay, so what about the one? You know, because that's really the purpose of this presentation is show, show you examples of one attacks. Uh, the consumer routers, they mostly have no services exposed to the one. Uh, and we're talking about defaults here, right? We're not talking about stuff, uh, you know, like enabling remote management, which exposes your HTTP configuration server to the internet, which is obviously a huge mistake, as we all know. Uh, you know, or, or even port forwarding so, you know, someone from the internet can penetrate and access internal services. We're talking about pure defaults, like the router comes as is from the factory. Uh, so they don't have a lot of stuff uh, listening. But on the enterprise side, is it is a little bit different uh, because enterprise uh, routers uh, or, you know, network devices, let's call it not just routers, they need to expose more uh, you know, they need to expose VPN, uh, they, need, they might need to perform some malware filtering, you know, they might need to do some email filtering, uh, TLS stripping, uh, proxying, this kind of stuff. And as you know, this opens up a lot of attack surface, and we as hackers, we love parsers. Um, and the thing is, again, just to drive home the point, when we talk about routers, we actually mean all kinds of network devices. 
So most enterprise uh, web application firewalls, uh, VPN terminators, SSL accelerators, it just really pimp up routers, you know, and just routers with more services. Um, and just to, uh, you know, in, back in the old days, the consumer uh, router one security was really bad. We have here two examples, one in 2011-12 by Rapid7, vulnerability in a UPnP server that was exposed to the one. Why? We don't know. Millions of routers affected. And another, uh, which was actually what got me interested in IoT and router security in the first place, which is by checkpoints. It's called a misfortune cookie uh, vulnerability. It's an arbitrary memory override through an HTTP cookie uh, of a management web server that is also exposed to the one. Uh, there's a very nice uh, talk online. You can look at it, it look it up, highly recommend it. Um, but these days, you know, things have improved markedly. Uh, one interfaces are fully firewalled and there are no services that are exposed. But we will see, you know, there's ways to get in. And, um, okay, let's now let's talk about Pontoon. As I said, the uh, Flashback Team is our war name. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we like to participate in Pontoon. Very nice competition, uh, great organization, great people participating. Uh, we started in Tokyo 2019. This was embedded devices. Then we did Miami, which is SCADA then more embedded devices and Ponto on Miami 2022, which we hope to participate if our bugs survive until then. We'll see because it got postponed. Um, and uh, yeah, and it was, it's very nice. We won Ponto Tokyo 2020. Um, yeah, we like, we really like participating in these competitions. Uh, so far we have delivered 12 exploits. Three didn't survive until the competition because, you know, the manufacturers, they like to drop the last minute updates. Uh, and one exploit failed, uh, well, it failed for them. It worked for us. Unfortunately, it was a remote competition, so we didn't have full control. When we had full, full control of our exploits, they never fail, as in if we're there with our laptops. And we won some nice cash prizes, nothing mind-blowing, but a good you know, side income. Okay, Rado, what about our workflow? Yeah, okay, so let's talk a little bit how we did we prepare and decide about the targets for, for the competition. So. Um, together with Pedro, we live in a completely different part of the world, uh, so we decided to actually make it our advantage. Uh, when we decided to um, work together, we said we, want, we need to work on the same targets uh, at the same time, so we can validate our ideas, our concepts, and like cross-check the things that we are doing. Um, and then we also had we have our full-time job, so we were all only working uh, like in the evenings. So when one person was sleeping, the other was uh, working. Then the person was leaving notes, the other one was uh, picking up after, so we were kind of working around the clock. Uh, but that means we really had to rely a lot on collaboration tools. And uh, for us, the, the Hydra server was just fantastic. It just uh, so amazing that you, you can reverse engineer binaries, like work together in a team. You just do your changes, uh, commit uh, those changes to the server. The other person pulls the the changes it's like um, beautiful it, it, it um, works on the on the conflicts and everything just amazing um, however that was very good for the preparation we, we noticed that very we have uh, very good results when we dedicate weekends uh, for the research uh, so we just the full uh, two days Saturday Sunday connect on like uh, zoom or something and just like uh, uh, push hard on those devices but it, you know, even better if we can be physically at the same location. So we said, okay, we are far away from each other. Let's uh, pick a nice country to travel to. That was in Laos. We we rented dirt bikes. We took our targets for phone to own. During the day, we were exploring the country. In the, in the afternoons, we were just uh, uh, working on uh, on devices. And we found, I think, at least one or two exploits this way in, like, I think, what was one week time. Um, and, but Pontoon is actually the competition which requires a lot of strategy if you want to win. Uh, so ours, as we had already a lot of experience targeting network devices, that was just uh, kind of natural to look at those. Uh, and, and then when we said we go for routers, we wanted to focus on the one interface because um, in our opinion, that is um, kind of a more difficult uh, area to explore and maybe not too many people will be looking at, at them. Uh, and they're also like re rewarded better. You have more points, you have more cash and everything. So it's better for you to, to win. Um, and then if we have time, we're going to look at LAN um, at, at the end of our research time. 
Uh, and on top of that, we said we, we should always avoid uh, common services like um, HTTP uh, servers, like UPnP, because we knew that there's going to be a lot of people looking at those. So we want to avoid collisions. So uh, it's our time is spent better on other uh, parts of the target. Uh, and then go deep. So don't try to go for the very first bug that you find, because it's, uh, it's most likely it's going to be collision, or the vendor is going to find the same. Um, and phone phone is not only the competition for researchers, also for the vendors. So when they see their name on the list, they kind of feel triggered. They want to say, hey, we also have an awesome research team that's going to work on the same targets, and they're going to push uh, the patches like two days before the competition, giving you no time to react on that. Uh, so our like kind of solution to that was try to have multiple bugs for the same targets. So you can uh, you can quickly like uh, get the other one um, and react to the situation that you have. Okay, so once the that was uh, se uh, set out the workflow, we, we can start working on the on the target. So for embedded devices, you need to have firmware because that's where all the uh, binaries are located. Uh, likely for consumer routers, you can in many cases you can just go to the vendor's website, download the firmware. Uh, it's most likely not even like um, encrypted, so you directly you pass it to Binwalk and, and there you go. Uh, but if it, this is not the case, you can dump the firmware from the device directly. So like in, in here's an example, so like camera where we, we had to desolder the NAND chip and read the content of it, or um, the other example, just directly attach a microcontroller to the NOR flash chip and read content of it. Um, the other example could be you can just sniff um, the communication on the network while the device is connecting to the vendor's server during, I don't know, during the update, and you can maybe find the location of the firmware on the server and just download it or, or reconstruct the firmware uh, from the wire dump. Um, and then uh, we always try to get as many debug interfaces as possible on the target because eventually we want to test our exploits on the real target. Uh, and usually what we'll do is just open the box and search for URPs because uh, they might be the, the easiest ones to work with at the very beginning at least. And then you attach your uh, to the UART and you see what you have. So do you have uh, read-write access? Do you have access to bootloader? Do you maybe have access immediately to the, uh, to the shell? Is it password protected? Yes, no. So you kind of adjust um, as you go. Um, but what happens if you have read-only access to UART? then maybe you have to modify it. So you, like in, in this picture, you can see that was one of our targets. We connected UART uh, interface to it. We are able to see everything on the console, but when we try to put any data, it was just nothing was happening. And then we realized that the Rx line on the board is uh, like physically cut from the, from the pins. And then we were in, in Laos traveling, and we didn't have any soldering equipment with us, so we just uh, got some paper clip and, and bridged the pad with the, <laughs> with the pin, and then we had to, like perfectly working uh, UART. Uh, and then a part of UART, you can try to find the JTAG, to do some DMA attacks, glitching, so anything that, that gives you uh, like an advantage uh, to work for the research purposes of the target. Uh, if nothing of that works, just try to find zero day on the component, which is not important for you. So that's how we got access on Cisco. Uh, we attached UART, there was nothing, and then we found zero day on other component, enabled Telnet, and we had full root access on the device. Or you can always try to reflash the modded firmware via TFTP if you have access to bootloader or like a physical trick reflash. Okay, so you, you got that, and then you start doing reconnaissance, and you start like uh, scanning your one, one interface, and then you think, okay, everything is blocked, right? So like case closed, nothing to work on. So it's actually, for the one interface, you need uh, a slightly different approach. So it's not uncommon to see that every single like surface is closed, but there are st it's still possible to pawn it. So at this point, I would like to uh, introduce our first one exploit that we use. The target was TP-Link Archer C7 on the MIPS CPU architecture. And we found a, a vulnerability in the DNS packet uh, parsing. So there is a small binary called con indicator running on the device. So what it does is just controlling the LED light on the box. And it's just shines like red, uh, green when it's connected to the internet, and then red when it's disconnected. Uh, and it's doing that by continuously sending DNS requests to the set of domains like google.com, uh, Netflix, TipLink, and so on. 
And when it got the response, it means, okay, I got the, um, I got the link, so our, everything is, is okay. Um, internet connection is working. Uh, and it binds to ephemeral port um, on the UDP, so that means on every boot of the device, it will randomly pick a number from 32,000 upwards. Okay, but to understand the vulnerability, vulnerability, I need to quickly give you a, a recap how the DNS packet is structured. So you have the, uh, our target, it sends DNS request. And then you can see in the packet in the green box, um, it's the DNS packet, and it starts with the transaction ID. The transaction ID is just a random number, which is used to match requests and responses together. So by the spec, if the, if the response comes, uh, um, it has to match the transaction ID of the, of the request. If it's not, it's not, the packet needs to be discarded. Uh, then we have information, some flags, information number of sections, and then finally comes the request part. And then the request part is of the uh, length, um, length uh, value type. So, length, uh, so the first byte says uh, what's the uh, length of the string that follows. So in this case, it's seven bytes. Uh, so we know the next seven bytes are the string. Uh, so in, in this case, tippling. Then you have three bytes length again. Uh, so the com, and then uh, we have a null. Uh, so each term is the, stri the string. So we know the request is for tippling.com. And then comes the response. And the response starts similarly. You have the transaction ID, uh, the flags, information about number of sections. And here we have the exact copy of our original query. And then finally comes the, the uh, section of the answer. And here you see it starts with C. So that means that the two most significant bits are set. And that indicates that the special mode, the compression mode is used. So, so to save the space on the packet, the size of the packet is just using the offset to that original query that we, that we saw, so that the um, processing part knows that the, the resolved IP that, that comes, comes afterwards is related to that uh, tippling.com. Okay, so as you know, the, uh, as you can see, the DNS packet is quite structured uh, protocol, so it kind of makes sense to use um, fuzzing on it uh, to find some vulnerability. And then I would like to introduce our uh, amazing father, our tweeting that we use to find Vuln, uh, and this is uh, def random. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, so uh, why, did, why actually did we use that? So when we start to work on a target, we, uh, we like to assess how it behaves under the stress situation. We attach the console to it, see, like send some garbage data, and maybe it, it will spit something, it will give you some indication where to look at. So like a very first hint, like uh, where should we focus our, like uh, on which part should we focus uh, in the first hand. And then, you know, you send some random data to that and then you see a crash, so that's beautiful. <laughs> um, so what happens? So the, the DNS reply comes to a con indicator um, and then there is a, a function called TP DNS receive and resolve. And it reads from the socket up to 2,160 bytes, puts that into DNS answer uh, buffer. Then comes the process resolved IP function, which takes the pointer to that buffer, and it sets, sets up its own stack with two important variables, resolved IP, 256 bytes, and DNS query buffer, 260 bytes. Uh, and that is all what it's doing. Then it's calling the DNS answer parser with two arguments, again, the pointer to the DNS answer buffer and pointer to the DNS query buffer, which is located in that process resolved IP uh, function stack. So what is happening in the DNS answer parser? So it is processing the answers that are uh, incoming. So in this case, the two most significant bits are not set. So that means we go to the default situation of uh, length um, value type, so we have the length and string format. And then it initiates a loop, and on every iteration, it just copies the portion of, of that uh, answer into the uh, DNS query buffer, and until it finds the null, uh, null byte. But however, there is no, no checks if the buffer is large enough, uh, so we can send a sequence of uh, uh, length value, length AA, it's large enough that it will overflow the buffer 
and eventually will give us control over the uh, return address. All right, Pedro, gonna give us information how did we exploit it? Yeah, let's move on to exploitation. Um, so, first of all, let's talk about the good news. Uh, system is imported into the binary, so we can use that to achieve RC. Uh, but from then onwards, it's only really bad news. Uh, the first one is that when we exit the function uh, with our controlled uh, return address, the buffer address is in the wrong register. So, okay, you can just use some rope for it, right? Well, not really. This is a really small binary, 61 kilobytes, has very few gadgets, and it is MIPS architecture. So it means the instructions have to be uh, byte aligned, uh, and you cannot just jump in the middle like you do with x86. Um, you got NX and SLR on pretty much everything, uh, except in the binary itself, which is only NX, does not have a SLR. Uh, so again, not easy to rope to libc or something like that uh, without, you know, uh, some kind of info leak. Uh, and our command can only be 63 bytes in length, but that's kind of okay. We can still do a lot of stuff with that. Okay, so uh, the, the first thing is uh, the process resolved IP function actually calls memcopy twice if we carefully craft input. Uh, and we can just abuse that and build a rope chain to, uh, you know, jump the system. Um, so let's try. So what we do is when we first enter the vulnerability in call process resolved IP, uh, we kind of uh, make sure that we go into the, it, it calls memcopy twice. So the package fulfills those conditions. And with that, our command is in the resolved IP buffer. And then our rope chain just comes in. Uh, the first one, we copy the address of resolved IP to a temporary register, and we prepare arguments for gadget two. Uh, then in gadget two, we just jump into the middle of another function, so we do a function reuse to copy uh, mem copy uh, to mem copy resolved IP to a known uh, read and write data address, uh, and then we just jump into system with command pointing to this uh, read write data address, uh, and then we pwn it. Uh, so, you know, this is a bit simplified. It's not a mind-blowing rope chain by any means, but it's just a little bit harder than normal. And that's it. We pawned the router via one, right? Well, there's something missing, right? We mentioned the firewall bypass. This is just a normal, you know, stack overflow. So where's the firewall bypass here? Uh, and for that, first, let me introduce you to contract. What is contract? Contract is uh, the connection tracking table that exists in the Linux uh, operating system, and I think similar ones might need to exist in the other, other operating systems. Um, and think of it this way. So you have your laptop, computer, whatever, right? And you don't have any uh, services running on it. You know, you're not running HTTP servers, so everything's fully locked down. Uh, there's no port listening that can be accessed to the outside. You've got a firewall, etc. But then you want to SSH into a host. So when you SSH into a host, the host has to send packets back to you, right? And these packets, they need to go through your firewall. And this is where contract comes in. When you make a connection to the outside, to a certain IP, then in the connection tracking table, uh, an entry, a new entry is added that says this IP can contact you back on this port, which is the client port you use to open the connection. This effectively punches a hole in your firewall that only that IP can uh, use to access back, right? So uh, if you have a TCP connection, you know, uh, there's a TCP handshake that ex uh, establishes a sort of TCP tunnel, right? Uh, so you can't really spoof uh, TCP um, uh, IP addresses, right? And, you know, it's, it's, it's just not doable. Uh, but with UDP, it's a different story. UDP is a connectionless protocol. So with UDP, you can easily spoof a source IP. Um, so how do we do this then? So how do we exploit this remotely over the one, over the internet? First, according to the RFC, the DNS request and response that Radek showed uh, needs to have a matching transaction ID. So if you recall, he pointed that out in the slides. Uh, but this binary con indicator, it, they fail to verify this transaction ID. So we, what we need to do is brute force the UDP port 
and then spoof the UDP source IP, and then that's it. We can, uh, you know, punch a hole through the firewall because we, you know, connection tracking in the contract is expecting that IP at that port. So we spoof the IP, uh, we find the, TC, the, the source port, um, and then that's it. We go through a lockdown firewall and we pwn it. Okay. Um, and uh, that's pretty much it for first exploit. So, you know, maybe some of you got lost, not that is extremely complex, but you know, in this presentation, something very technical always gets lost. Now let's talk about another interesting, but very different one exploit that we also used. This is an insecure update that drops a permanent backdoor. Our first target was the Netgear R6700, which has an ARM CPU and we used it first in Ponto in Tokyo 2019. But we used variations of this vulnerability in pretty much every competition. So imagine this, uh, we just arrived in Tokyo, first time ever, fascinated by Tokyo lights. Uh, this is November 2019. Uh, we're still hugely jet lagged because we had to do you know, at least 10 hours to get there. And the day before the competition, we meet with ZDI you know, to arrange for the competition. We come armed with one one exploit, so the, the one we just described to you, the DNS, and we got two LAN exploits. And then we have a meeting with ZDI, and they, they just start to tease us. They start to say, you guys are lying. Why don't you have a one exploit for the other router? Oh, you're lying, you're lying, you need to do this. And because no one had registered for the, that specific target. So they pushed us and pushed us, and we just said whatever, and just we just went home and slept. Well, not really. So we're at home. We're, uh, you know, a bit pissed off, uh, and we just decided to kind of uh, look at it again, because obviously we already had looked at it. You can see here on the left-hand side, Radic looking pretty desperate with uh, lots of Red Bulls around him. But in the end, we pulled through. Uh, we didn't sleep at all that night, which was fine because we were, all the other exploits were tested to death, uh, but we were able to produce an exploit uh, in about nine hours. So. How did we do it? As I said before the competition, we also hooked up the router's one interface and started end mapping it, and nothing came up as before. But then, you know, I'm being honest here, it was by pure luck uh, we decided to reboot the router while looking at Wireshark. And then we noticed it connect to a URL via HTTPS, and it's actually a firmware, uh, in this case, was a binary update mechanism. Okay, this is interesting. Uh, but it's connecting via HTTPS, right? What can we do? Luckily for us, they screwed up big time. What do they do? They use WGET with no check certificate. So if you don't know what this means, it means we can just present any HTTPS certificate, you know, the burp certificate, anyone you can generate on your computer, and it will be accepted. Uh, and that's it. So we, we like to think of this as a kind of forgotten bug class. You know, uh, basically, firmware and binaries are downloaded in security, insecurely. In this case, they're done over HTTPS, but the certificate is not checked. And we exploited this bug multiple times in other devices. Uh, you know, sometimes there's some crappy custom crypto or uh, hard-coded AES key used for obfusc obfuscation. Uh, sometimes they don't even bother with HTTPS, they just use HTTP or FTP. And sometimes we can do crazy stuff like command injection in the file name. You don't even need to deliver an exploit. Uh, and like I said, we use this multiple times, uh, you know, until the last competition a few months ago, where finally some smart people from other teams reverse engineered our exploits because we didn't publish anything until now. And they found out how to pull this in this last competition. There were a lot of exploits like this. So uh, what's our plan of attack? We control DNS. We point the update server hostname to us. We serve this malicious firmware binary update uh, with a fake certificates and in the specific format that it expects. And we just pawn the router with full persistence. Uh, and in this specific case, a firmware reset won't save you. And the reason is simple. So routers, they typically have uh, you know, uh, volatile memory. So there's, uh, you know, the, the file system is unpacked at every boot and it resides in RAM. 
but they always have a, a small area which is a flash read only. And in this case, this specific binary was downloaded there, and it just you could firmware reset or whatever all you wanted, the binary would stay there forever until we pawned it again. So it was quite nice in that aspect. Um, Okay, but I know what you're thinking, right? This is super lame. Uh, we require control over DNS. This could never happen in real life. Well, not really. I mean, there are many attack scenarios you can think, starting from the most extreme, uh, BGP hijack. So if you know about BGP, here's an example of the tweet. So Brazilian telco that hijacks Google DNS. So this is a good example, but maybe the most extreme. Someone hijacks, you know, Cloudflare DNS, Google DNS, etc. Then we go down a bit uh, in this uh, probability list, and we have the DNS server provider hijack, especially for smaller ISPs. There are reports of certain ISPs in certain countries basically, you know, injecting, uh, you know, uh, DNS entries that they control to provide ads or something like that. Uh, then another, which is even more probable, is ISP cooperation with law enforcement. You know, uh, there have also been reports, uh, some of you might know better than me, of ISPs and other entities cooperating with law enforcement and, again, hijacking DNS for certain uh, people or, or sites. But, you know, the most problem of all of these is just basic DNS cache poisoning, you know, which is an attack that's, uh, you know, get, getting more and more, happening more and more often and becoming more relevant. And this is, you know, it's the easiest to pull off out of all of these. And, you know, like this, you can enjoy your shells. But, okay, again, I know what you're thinking. The first exploit was nice, the second one is nice too, but they all have some kind of, uh, you know, thing that you need to do. You need to brute force the UDP port in the other case, or you need to control DNS in this case. So how about we show you an exploit that works remotely over the internet uh, with default settings with no constraints whatsoever? What do you think, Radek? Yeah, <laughs> let's go for it. So uh, that's uh, one exploit number three: uh, Cisco RV340 VPN router running ARM CPU architecture. Uh, it's the latest exploit that we presented. It was actually patched last week, and I think on Tuesday Cisco released uh, advisories for for this bug, and it's um, rated with CVSS Core 10. Uh, so here we um, exploit the um, core functionality of the router, the VPN endpoint. So I'd like to ask anybody who's using any connect when connecting, working from home, because I was using my previous work and I know it's uh, pretty, uh, pretty popular. So for anybody who is not using or is using, so this is the uh, screenshot of the any connect client. So when you uh, connect to your organization, you, your client is sending the uh, AnyConnect packet, is doing the uh, initialization, the authentication, and, and everything is fine, you just get granted access to your internal network. Uh, so we found vul vulnerability in the uh, AnyConnect uh, packet. So it's a very, very simple one, it's actually quite surprising. Uh, so when the AnyConnect packet comes, it is in a form of HTTP header and a body. And there is a function that reads the HTTP uh, header into the packet in buffer, which is 4,000 hex size. And then the HTTP body is read into the body buffer, also 4,000 hex size. But if you notice, there is some space between HTTP header and the body. Uh, so there's a, a string and ncat function, which tries to move those two data together into one continuous space. Uh, with the string ncat as, as mentioned. So technically you can see it's already overflow here. So you can have 4,000 hex byte uh, buffer on top and if you have your body is 4,000 and you have data there, you, just, you, you already overflow the uh, packet in uh, buffer. But uh, this is not really like, didn't really give us anything. Um, it wasn't very useful. So let's move on. So this packet like this um, was picked up by the SSL server uh, receive data notify message insert function, which takes two arguments, the pointer to the packet in buffer, so where our data is already prepared, uh, and control data, and the number of bytes read. And it set up its own stack, the uh, stack variable buffer with 4,000 hex, and uh, you can already probably see where it's going. There is a mem copy. You have much more data, up to 8,000, that you try to fit into 4,000 buffer. Uh, you just overflow it and, and control um, 
uh, return address. So obviously what happens, you have beautiful uh, segmentation fold um, and you move on to the exploitation part. Uh, so um, we have memcopy function, but we cannot really use null bytes because the data that we control is uh, processed by uh, string ncat. And the data and the text segments were mapped into memory where we needed the null byte, uh, so ROP might be quite challenging. Um, then on top of that, all the shared libraries are randomized. And when we try to search for any, like a code which is already there in the binder that we could immediately jump to, to get like some instant RC, we didn't find anything. Uh, but you know, it's uh, 2022, everybody takes security seriously, right? So why don't we just have uh, executable stack? <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you very much, Cisco. When you see this is just basically a textbook shellcode exploitation, you plant your shellcode, return address, to jump, and you know, <laughs> nothing more than that. Uh, so th that's the entire exploit. It's uh, quite short and quite simple. Uh, so we really wanted to make a live demo, but uh, because of the circumstances that we're at, we, we couldn't. But uh, good for you guys. We have our own YouTube channel. We like to send technical videos uh, as well. So we're we going to play a, a video that we recorded some time ago. Hi, everyone. This is Pedro from the Flashback Team, and today I'm coming to you from the beautiful country of Thailand. And why, you ask? Is it to make you jealous? A little bit. That's not the main reason. The main reason is, today we're going to hack Radek, who is in Munich, Germany, over 9,000 kilometers away, with an exploit over the internet for the Cisco RV340 router. Okay. If you want more details, check our advisory. But for now, step right into my office. Let's get started. Hey guys, and I'm inside in Munich enjoying my Bavarian breakfast. This is our target, Cisco RV340 business class router. We use this exploit at home to home 2021 in Austin. This is not some lame web interface exposed exploit, this is a real, no bullshit, zero click internet routable exploit. Shodan says there are 75,000 victims in the world right now. I'm one of them, so let's pawn it. Prost. Okay, Petro, I think you need my public IP address. So here it is, that's my public IP address. Uh, but you know what? I'm gonna quickly log in to my router and I will show you my host name. So that's my host name. So let's see if you can get it. Let's see, Radek. Okay, so now we're showing my screen. And here on the right hand, on the left hand side, we have my IP address, which is a Thai IP address. And on the left hand side, we have my AWS machine in the Singapore region. And the reason is we need to use an AWS machine to receive our reverse shell because my Thai IP address is not internet routable, meaning that if we're able to exploit Radek, then I cannot receive it as a reverse shell on my Thai computer. It needs to be on an AWS machine in Singapore. So let's start our reverse shell here in the Singaporean machine. And let's go to the Thai machine and let's connect to Radek's IP. Two dot two three five. Okay, so this is your IP address, right, Radek? Yeah, I believe so. Are you ready to get on? I think you can always try. Oh, what's that, Radek? What is this I... thing see here? Let's see. Oh, what's this, Radek? I... Oh, this, do you know this host name? Have you seen it before? <laughs> okay, you know what, Pedro, I challenge you. Um, if you're really having my router, I challenge you to link LED on my router. Okay, so let's do it. Oh, 
Oh, what's that, Roddick? Looks like your router has been owned. Uh, you know what? I can reboot it for you. Are you do you want that? Yeah, please reboot and get the hell out of my network. And uh, Cisco, please patch this ASAP. Yeah, so. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Cisco patched it. Uh, they, they, yeah, the stack is no longer executable. They added um, stack cookies on top of that. They changed all the uh, mem copies to safe mem copies. So they did some work, um, but still, like the problem with those devices is that um, the updates they come, they're not updated like immediately. So there's going to be a lot of devices in the in the world that is going to never receive the update because the uh, people are not so so fast with those. Uh, so yeah, I think we're gonna give some time uh, for people to patch and then we release the exploit at some point. Um, yeah, okay, Pedro, uh, gonna give some conclusions? Yeah, okay. So let's talk about uh, our conclusions and... Uh, oh, I think I lost remote control of the slides. Are they changing? I can do it for you, but I've lost as well. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's see. Can I control? Okay. Now I can control. Okay. Now let's talk. We have our proprietary flashback over the internet exploitability score and let's uh, score our exploits. So TP-Link DNS, what do you think? Uh, I'd say, you know, uh, it is remotely exploitable, obviously, but it requires you to brute force the UDP source ports, uh, which is the hardest. Uh, I mean, it's not hard. You can do it in a few seconds, but you still need to do it. And you need to know which IP was contacted, but there are only like 20 or so. Uh, so I say we gave it 6 out of 10, right? Then we got our insecure update. This one is a bit more tricky. You need to have control out of DNS or DNS cache poisoning. So we give it a four out of 10. And finally, our SSL VPN, which is a very simple but very nice exploit and, you know, no conditions. So definitely a 10 out of 10 here. Okay. And um, look, <clears throat> maybe we just got lucky with the Cisco Enterprise router, right? How can enterprise gear be so crappy and you know that one was a, it was an enterprise router but it was an smb a cheap one right so the high-end stuff it's not that vulnerable right no i mean uh plenty of examples here i just picked these ones uh, they're not the most recent ones but they're the ones i like um was for example uh by orange side orange and meshang you know they're well known probably most of you know the, already we got uh, one in 2019 in the Pan SSL gateway, which is quite an expensive uh, SSL appliance enterprise. Uh, and it's a format string vulnerability. I mean, you know, 2019 with format string vulnerabilities in an enterprise, uh, very expensive gear. And here on the right hand side, you have the post request that shows how to exploit it. It is a joke. In fact, it's quite similar to our Cisco one, but it's a total joke. And then two other examples here, just examples I picked, these are from 2021, which is that five big, big IP. The one in the middle, I think, also has a stack executable, so it's also a joke. And the one on the left, uh, it's a command injection. So, you know, really, these enterprise class devices have terrible security. And that's one of the things that we want to, to share with you, you know. Uh, uh, in our experience, these enterprise devices, they might be much more expensive, but they are not better is more secure than the consumer ones you know there are just less people looking at them right you know the, it's more expensive hackers like us cannot access it which also makes me think about those carriers that uh, you know radix showed at the beginning of the presentation that go up to two million you know no hackers touch these uh, you know they might be even crappier than consumer routers who knows um Okay, so, but why, why do these exist, right, uh, in enterprise class devices? Well, it's, you know, the, the same story all over. Most network device vendors, they don't spend enough money on security. So hackers, you know, like uh, us and you, we're very expensive, right? We also, we all got nice fat salaries, as you know. Uh, and, you know, internal staff likely doesn't have the full set of skills required because people who typically, you know, there are exceptions, typically people who are, 
uh, like to be on the offensive side. They don't like to, you know, to, to be in companies doing a lot of defensive work. Um, and again, vendors might have a lot of devices, firmware versions, and use a lot of third-party components and code. Sometimes it's very hard to keep track of it all. You know, imagine how much, how many devices Cisco has to manage. And another thing which is important, I'm not really sure it applies to the Cisco one, but I wouldn't be surprised if it does, is that some devices are manufactured by third parties. And these then, uh, they make like a platform that is white labeled to a vendor. Uh, this happens in consumer routers. Again, wouldn't be surprised if they happen in enterprise ones. Uh, and sometimes these third parties can go bust and uh, you know they have no source code or the engineers that uh, you know from the main company that hired the, the white label company they don't know the code so it's very hard to fix a bug there and a lot uh, you know sometimes these white label uh, devices they are shared across many vendors so if there's a bug in the base sdk or the base device that is then white labeled by three or four vendors you know all these devices are affected um the thing is, on the one side, uh, what's the future? So on the consumer enterprise routers, one is being hardened somewhat, but they still make bas basic mistakes. So Max, uh, Max Ploit, he used a very nice IPv6 trick in Ponto in 2019, where the IPv4 fire, uh, you know, interface uh, was completely firewalled, but IPv6 was not. So he was able to use that to access an internal service. And as we know, the LAN internal services are, you know, they're not very good in terms of security, so that's it. Um, but, you know, things are definitely improving. And you know, one thing is we like to think that we contribute to that, you know, uh, or we hope so, uh, by finding these vulns, you know. Uh, and, and But what can we do as hackers, right? Uh, we need to go deeper. Uh, we need to start looking at the kernel parsers for the IP, TCP, etc., all these protocols. Uh, wireless LAN, Bluetooth, you know, there's been some also really nice attacks in the past few years on these surfaces. Uh, another thing that's quite common in these network devices are custom vendor models. Um, and uh, sometimes, you know, there is the ones that implement firewall, uh, they have firewall kernel modules, they implement net filter hooks, net filter is the uh, Linux firewall, uh, which processes packets, you know, does the filtering, so a lot of interesting stuff can happen there. Uh, but, you know, I think uh, one of the things most important uh, that we think uh, it, it's right now in the future are the tunneling techniques. So SSRF, CSRF, you know, the DNS uh, uh, cache poisonings, and even cross-site scripting. So again, we got here another very short video that we produced that shows a cross-site scripting to root attack, uh, you know. Um, there's, there are some mitigations in the works for this. There's W3C private network access. Uh, we don't know how it's going to look. Uh, but, you know, we do expect uh, things in the one generally will get harder. They are getting harder. We notice that every competition, and they will continue to get harder. So we just got to try harder. Um, and that's it. I mean, uh, we hope you had fun, you know. Uh, this was more like a fun presentation just to show what we did and also to explain our methodology, how we achieve things. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's pretty much it. Radek? Yes, thank you very much for attending this talk. Any questions? Um, just a clever clarification for the second vulner vulnerability in the Netgear. Uh, the update process happens only when you turn it up, like uh, you reboot it, or it happens every now and then. So you mean the, if the communication towards the server, that yeah. happens every time the route reboots because it checks for uh, if there's any, any update okay. ready for... All right, for so DNS poisoning is really an option. Yes, right. okay. yes. Uh, I would like to know um, these three models. Were the were these like three models in a large haystack of routers that you tried to hack, and 
like most are secure, but just these three you manage to hack, or is it like every device you look at, you somehow get into it? So, so it depends on the device. So uh, I think the number of devices that we together with Pedro points, I don't know. I think Pedro has like over 50 RCs on network devices, and like he's one of the top contributors to Metasploit projects for that. Um, so you you always tr maybe find something. Maybe not everything's exploitable over the over the one. So definitely there are the, the the routers which uh, you cannot. We we didn't like manage to exploit for point one, for instance, because maybe the attack service was not there, or we didn't have enough time, or you have to like find vulnerabilities like a um, kernel modules or or, or anything, so, so something like that. So it depends really what what is your what is your goal and what you want to achieve. Thank you very much. Yeah, it also depends on the time, you know, uh, because uh, you have to understand that with Pont1, we're under a lot of pressure, a lot of time pressure. We want to hit the maximum number of targets. So while, as we said in the strategy, we also look for in places that we hope most people don't look, uh, we also try to get the easiest vulnerabilities in those places. Because, you know, if we start looking at, like we said, in the go deeper parts, at the kernel parsers, kernel models, this kind of stuff, it's just going to consume a lot of time. Um, so I do expect most routers to be vulnerable, um, you know, or network devices to be vulnerable, just some will be more than others. Yeah, especially if you can I add to that. So uh, on the LAN interface, you will find a lot of vulnerabilities, like authenticated, not authenticated, but on, on the van, it's uh, much more harder to get reliable exploit. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, then uh, let's thank the speakers and we'll reconvene at four o'clock. Thank you very much.